Hello, and welcome to this interview with the 2022 Khairallah Prize Honorable Mention winner, Eli Tare El Bishalani Lynch. My name is Lauren Stewart Khater Meyer, and I'm honored to host this interview. The Moise Khairallah Center for Lebanese Diaspora Studies is dedicated to research about Lebanese immigrants in the United States and throughout the world, and to preserving and sharing that knowledge with the scholarly community and general public. As part of advancing its mission, the Khairallah Center awards several annual prizes, of which the Khairallah Prize is one. The Khairallah Prize recognizes the best artistic expressions of Lebanon and the Lebanese diaspora, whether in visual art, written work, performance or electronic medium, the Khairala Prize identifies, awards, and publicly honors those whose original work focuses on any aspect of life in Lebanon or among Lebanese immigrants, whether in the past or present. This year, with an abundance of excellent submissions, the selection committee has elected to award an honorable mention with a monetary prize of $2,000. Eli Tariq al Bishalani Lynch has won this distinction with their work, The Good Arabs. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Eli. Eli is a writer living in Chiochiake. Their work is, has appeared in the Best Canadian Poetry 2018 Anthology, The New Quarterly, ARC Poetry Ma Magazine, and elsewhere. Their book, Not Body 2020, published by Metatron Press, was shortlisted for the QWF Concordia First Book Award, and their second book, The Good Arabs, published by Metonymy Press in 2021, was granted the honorable mention for poetry by the Arab American Book Awards and won the Grand Prix du Livre de Montréal. Their translation of Gabriel Boulian Tremblay's La Fille d'Elle-Même from the French is forthcoming spring 2023. With co-editor Samia Marshi, they are editing El Ghoraba, an anthology of weird and experimental queer and trans writing by Arab and Arab Arabophone writers forthcoming spring 2024. They are also an acquisitions editor at Metonymy Press. Eli, welcome. We are so glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. Um, so to start off, we had that great bio, but I would love to have you speak a little bit about your background, um, your connection to Lebanon, um, and how you sort of view yourself on that journey of being a member of the Lebanese community of the Lebanese diaspora community. Sure. So I'm um, mixed race. I'm half Lebanese on my mom's side, and my dad is white Canadian. Um, I grew up, well, I was born in Canada, but then ended up moving to Lebanon for several years as a kid. So I did some of my education in Lebanon and learned how to read and write and was kind of immersed in um, being in Lebanon. And then ended up, my family ended up moving back to Canada at some point. Um, so a lot of the book, the, and then, you know, sometimes would, would go visit depending on what the situation was like there and, um, and, you know, financial, et cetera. Right. <laughs> um, but a lot of the experiences in the book that I take from are often experiences that I had while in Lebanon though some of them are just from, you know, being in Canada and kind of watching, seeing what's mm. happening and talking to my family and kind of their experiences. Um, and then looking into the history of Lebanon, um, the history of my family coming to Canada as refugees and then deciding to move back. Um, and so that I'm kind of, that's my relationship to Lebanon and my relationship to being a diasporic writer and kind of mm. thinking through um, my place and also the places that I'm from. Right. And I think we're going to talk about that because I think one of the truly wonderful things about this anthology is the way you kind of weave what it is to have these nostalgic memories of a place that you experienced perhaps as a child. I know I had those memories from visiting as a child. Um, and then the realities you're faced with as an adult that perhaps were invisible to us as children. Um, mm -hmm. but maybe have intensified as time has gone on. It's always hard to to sort of scale one crisis against another, but it's certainly yeah. at the point right now where being in the diaspora is very hard to see what's happening there. Yeah, um, and I'm curious, how did that, if at all, impact your journey towards becoming a writer and a poet? Is that something that you took into consideration? Did you stumble into poetry kind of haphazardly? What brought you to this point? 
Well, I've always been a pretty avid reader. As a kid, I would, you know, go to the library and get stacks of books and read them in two weeks and kind of feverishly go get more. Um, and so I've always been a reader. And then I kind of started off writing, doing more things like um, what some people imagine as fan fiction, mm. some of which was very much within that realm and but also just kind of thinking about the stories I was reading and imagining worlds alongside the things that I was reading um and actually um I haven't thought about this until now but I think that has really shaped my relationship to writing because a lot of my writing is in conversation with other people with other writers um with what's going on in the world and so I'm can kind of continuing this tradition of you know writing in collaboration in some way with others um and then I only really got to poetry uh maybe 17 18 um during my last year of high school where I had a, a writing teacher who um kind of showed us a lot of different kinds of genres of writing and kind of gave us the space to test them out and I wrote very bad poems, but was really excited about it. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of, and I had always been interested in music and singing. And so I think poetry and its lyricism and um, the space that you can play with sound and words really drew me in. And since then have kind of been working in that medium and you know, dipping my toes into fiction, but often returning to poetry. And I must say, for having come to it as late as you say you did, it, you truly have a remarkable talent for it. Um, I really love the way that your poems are in conversation, not with just yourself and your memories, but with the world. Um, I think the title itself kind of bears record of that in, in that you're saying the good Arabs. And, and I think anyone who identifies with an Arab identity understands that that's in response to a lot of cultural stereotypes that we're up against, whether or not we want to be. Um, and I'm, I'm actually to kind of turned to the project. I'd love to speak more, um, more in a more detailed fashion about it. Um, in your statement, when you submitted for the prize, you mentioned that the good Arabs shows how we might love amid dismay, adore the pungent and the ugly, and exist in our multiple identities across oceans. And aside from that being poetic in and of itself, really beautiful concept. Um, how can, how would you like to elaborate on that as like an inspiration for how you were approaching this project? Because it's not just about poems about Lebanon. It's not just about poems about yourself. There really are conversations happening here with a variety of people, whether named or not explicitly in the writing. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm trying to remember the beginning of your question. Um, <laughs> oh, based on the, the, the part the the yes, thing I based on your quote and I'm happy to reread it if you'd like me to no no worries that now I'm remembering I'm like ah oh, yes I wrote that <laughs> write that um yeah I guess I guess for me um the thing that I was trying to do with this book this is a book that kind of started I would say probably um nine years ago I started writing poetry and kind of um maybe yeah eight or nine years ago and kind of thinking through the particularity of my own sensibility experience um, and what I could do to put that in a poem. Mm -hmm. I think in, originally I was writing these kind of vague poems that I had a um, teacher kind of um, not so gently tell me that, you know, it might mean something to me, but it does not mean anything to anyone <laughs> else. And I was like, perhaps you're right. <laughs> and it, you know, I was a bit more hurt when I first heard it, but I think it is good, a good piece of mm -hmm. advice. And so I started thinking actually about what I was able to write as an individual, what was interesting about my perspective, right. whether that has to do with identity or just the way I see the world. Um, and so I started kind of writing these poems in very early, early iterations um, and kind of put that project aside and was writing Not Body for a while. Mm -hmm and kind of intensely moving in that space, but then coming back to the good Arabs as um, a bit of a, when I when I found non-body heart, I would move to the other book and mm -hmm. kind of think through those poems. Um, and when I was kind of coming together with a collection of these poems, I was trying to think of what linked to them um, and something felt missing as I was working on it. 
Um, and then I realized that I wanted this to be this conversation. I wanted it to be this questioning of different ideas and identities and modes of thinking. Um, but I didn't want it to be, I didn't want it to have an easy answer. Mm. And so I kind of pushed the questioning to maybe an extreme or to a um, further level so that the book itself is kind of opening the conversation to people, opening conversations about multiple things rather than yeah, sitting with an easy answer being like, well, one plus one equals two, which right. ultimately when we're talking about such kind of intense subject matter, it doesn't, that doesn't make sense. That's not how we live in the world no. as, you know, um, beautiful, weird, gross people, um, yes. you know? Um, and so I think I wanted to show also specifically thinking about Arabs, like the beauty of Arab community and maybe the darker sides of Arab community and Lebanese mm -hmm. community and not as a way to critique out of love, but rather, you know, out of a sense of love for my right. community and thinking about what, how we can change and how we can be better. Yeah. And I think that's the thing for me that was the most touching in the work was that um, I'm also mixed race. And I think one of the most challenging parts of that identity is that you feel torn between needing to defend this culture and then turning around and being like, but it's deeply problematic. And here's right. why. Yeah. Um, and it's so hard to navigate that, especially in um, a Western dominated, a white dominated space where you feel the need to say, but look at all these beautiful things that you're missing when all you can talk about is the terrorism and the violence and the misogyny. And yes, those are all real things and we're trying to deal with them, but the way to deal with them is to sort of disentangle the beautiful from the ugly um, and to, to do that act of loving. And I, I think that work is worth the effort. And I think your book really points to that, um, which was very moving um, to me. In the spirit of that, I would love for you to read one of your selected poems. I think we decided on In the Heart of the Heart of More Garbage, um, mm -hmm. which was truly a gem. They all were so wonderful. But if you would like to read that for us, we would be honored sure. to hear you. Sounds good. Um, so just to give a little bit of a preface to this poem, it's one of the poems that contends with a lot of things, as all the poems do, but also with the garbage crisis in Lebanon and kind of the effects of the garbage crisis. Um, a lot of the poems think about the garbage crisis and there's this kind of lingering garbage throughout the poem and the kind of mm -hmm. the smell. I really wanted to, to have that lingering throughout the book. So this is one of the poems that's kind of trying to do that. Um, and then the title is in reference to Etel Adnan's In the Heart of the Heart of Another Country, mm -hmm. which is then also a reference to um, it's not William Gibson, someone, a man, yeah. <laughs> whose book is called In the Heart of the Heart of, uh, of the Country, I think. Mm. Um, so it's kind of like a lineage. So, In the Heart of the Heart of More Garbage. I would look up, if only to see the newness in the sky, but clouded over by dust, the sun filters in, and a snake, no, maybe a gecko, trying to run away, hides in the bushes to come out later at night. When the sun is down, people in their houses, the nightly power outage, a type of alarm at the stroke of midnight. We sit on the balcony, finally see the stars for a few minutes before some lights come back on, their generators working harder through the night. Though some places still shrouded in darkness are only lit, by candles we cannot see. Gathered by the side of the road, the dust almost settled, the no sidewalk, the no cars, the no others, the silence of nature that is not silent but deep with sound, deep with movement. The dust finally settled before another car rush, before another car rushes by, throws it back up into the air. Hold the fig gently, but firmly in between two fingers. Squeeze the smell potent and sweet. Bring it close to your nose to push away the smell of garbage. Repeat until your nostrils are filled. The smell of protective shield, honeyed cloth. 
the mirage only as long as fig season. Cut it in half, the raw fig in your hand, reveal the red insides, scoop them out, making a V shape with your index finger, with your middle finger, and curl your fingers. Work through the insides, pulling apart fleshy, chewy flesh. You pass one half over to tell them just how hard to handle it. Tell them precisely how to do it with care, lowering the insides into your mouth, a soft, enthusiastic plop. Drop onto your tongue, orange seeds getting stuck in your teeth. You see men throwing large bags of garbage over the sides of mountains to places you can't see. Imagine a small child playing outside, screaming in fear as they rain down on his family field, mutilating the work, weeks of sweat and sun, weeks of unripe bananas, squashed in the dry dirt, falling onto trees, figs hitting the ground, purple breaking to reveal thick red lines of ants in formation, a feast they'll bring back to their queen. The cigales in the south of France return like a fever dream, back from the insides of memories, barely legible, but the soft salmon of early sky, sun rising into newness, the dark filled with country stars, the energy in the air, so charged with cigales, so heavy with muteness, the twinkling of the stars, quiet yet so loud. It happened in the fullness of my mouth around a mango, the yellow juices leaking down my chin. You tell me I can no longer smell the sandalwood incense in the studio without thinking that someone just had a shit and is trying to mask the smell. So the myth goes like this, the little joy bon, the little mangy one, climbs the mountain tirelessly. No, wait a second, that's not right. Actually, she screamed from the top of the cliff. People shall call me Asad. She said, people shall look on differently. People shall not throw things from my throne. Peace will be present and devotional. People throw garbage into the Mediterranean Sea at capacity. The garbage ship shipped off to Russia, but not really. Who will buy our garbage when it's too much? Who to pay for garbage removal? Men fake companies, pretend to move the garbage from one side of the country to the other, take the money and run. The beaches no longer what they used to be. Garbage on the buoy, garbage on the docks, garbage on the expensive beach, garbage on the free beach, garbage in the mouths of seagulls, garbage between your toes, garbage on the sea dews, garbage on the roofs of old Mercedes garbage on the hoods of buses. The summer so hot, almost sickly sweet. What if the day of garbage has finally come? Will the seas part again? Walls of garbage consuming the lands. She holds her prayer beads up high above her head. The second coming, Jesus looking a little darker than the photo hung in her living room. The smell of jasmine wafts into your living room, facing champagne. The smell of lilacs in the bags under your pillows. The smell of lilacs in the alleys. And the Park X sunsets more purple than any in the rest of the city. We sit on the balcony and you tell me, look, look, have you seen how purple my purple heart is now? My cousin runs out of the car to the middle of the highway, raises his hand up straight. And before we know it, he's gone in a crowded van, riding away to the sounds and smells of garbage. Thank you so much, Eli. That was beautiful. Um, and upon listening to you read that, I'm struck by how not just sensual, but sensory your writing is. That um, I think perhaps in response to that, that comment from a former teacher, in, rather than existing in sort of these vague, um, emotional states, you are hitting all of the senses, um, whether for good or for mm -hmm. bad. And I'm wondering um, how much of this was your own experience? Um, 
what is it like to write about that and to sort of imagine, you know, the stench we, for those of us who've been to Lebanon in, in the last few years, we know the stench, we know what it smells like on the streets, but we, we likewise know the tastes um, and the way to sort of mask it. Um, what has that been like writing those kinds of things for you and how much of that is um, based on your own experiences or just based on the imagining of sensory experiences that you know from others? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some of them are based on my own kind of sensory experiences and others are kind of pushing, yeah, the sensory imagination, I guess. Um, and I think for me, it became in this book really important to bring people exactly where I wanted them to be. Um, and especially in this poem, there's so much about smell. And um, I read that smell is actually the sense that's most linked to memory. Um, and so it made sense for me to, to go to smell, to kind of bring someone to a specific place and kind of bring me back to a place um, and imagine, you know, what's happening in that place um, now and also what was happening at the time. Um, and I think, yeah, with poetry, the the beauty and the fun of writing poetry is to get to live in that, you know, sensorial, yeah. sensual space. And I really love working in that space. And so this poem is definitely like maybe one of the most sense specific mm -hmm. poems. And I really loved writing it and getting to play in that area. And it is really nice to read. I, I hadn't actually been reading that poem. I kind of go through phases deciding which poems to read at different readings. Sure. And recently I've been like, oh, you know, some people have heard these certain poems a lot. I want to try to mix it up. And so I only, I prepared yesterday to read this poem at a reading that I did. And I was like, I actually really enjoy reading that poem, <laughs> which is why I wanted to bring it yeah. today. Um, and so it's kind of a fun thing, like, you know, if, after the book has been published for a bit to kind of re come to new things in the book. Yeah. And to, to go back and realize what beauty you've, you've wrought in it. That, mm. Oh, look at that. That's, that's actually quite amazing. Um, <laughs> I'm curious based on the smell and the memory association, what is the most nostalgic smell for you that brings you straight back to those like warm, fuzzy, um, kind of, you know, a grandma hug moment in Lebanon? Um, definitely the smell of um, um, gardenia and, um, oh, now I'm forgetting the name of the other flower. <laughs> but floral, yeah, I think the floral yeah. is, is very, yeah. um, it's very pervasive, but in this really lovely way where you're like, what am I walking through like a beautiful botanical garden and it's just yeah. somebody's yard yeah exactly like I I there's there was a tree in front of my grandmother's house um she had she now lives in an apartment but she used to live in this like kind of old brick house and there was this like beautiful tree in front of her house and that smell is just like lingers in my memory yeah um and when you were like grandmother hug it kind of also took me there <laughs> It probably also helps that almost all the tetas had the like floral perfume. So yeah. it's not just outside the homes, it's it's in the arms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's on the tables, it's everywhere. It's it's lovely. Mm -hmm. Um, which um which intensifies the sorrow at the garbage smell because you're like, mm -hmm. there are all these beautiful things that we could be experiencing, and instead we're watching this river of sludge make its way down to the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um to sort of pivot a little bit, you addressed this a little earlier, and I wanted to go back to it because I think it's really a powerful theme throughout the Good Arabs, is this concept of liminality. Um, and you mentioned in your early introduction that you're mixed race, um, mm -hmm. that you're currently working on some writing that is has to do with queer experiences. And I think the sort of the mixed race, the diaspora, um, living between memories of childhood and the realities of adulthood, um, queer experiences, all of these things are so liminal. Um, and it's very hard to put that into words, but why did you find that such a focal point as you were writing this anthology? I mean, part of it was just kind of mining my experience, you know, and a lot of, as you mentioned, a lot of certain experiences that I have do live in that liminal space. Yeah. And I think for me, the in-betweens are where the fun happens, where the play can happen, you yeah. know? Um, I mean, even the book itself, you know, I kind of use many different genres, types of poetry, um, because I really love playing in that space yeah. that it actually, I think, you know, there's the 
downside of kind of being in between, which is that you're kind of pulled. But yeah. then the nice side of being in between is that you get to pull with it. You know, you get yeah. to move through different spaces and kind of it, it does give more freedom than being restricted to something. Um, and I also just kind of wanted to write about my experiences because there are so few books by, you know, queer and trans Arabs and, mm. um, also like, you know, books, at least in my experience of reading books in English that kind of talk about the in-betweens, the like mm. the good, the bad and the ugly, and yeah. kind of like thinking critically about Lebanon as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, in that way that I was saying before as like a loving gesture. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's, I mean, I already said this, but it's just, it's where I like to play. It's like yeah. poetry is play for me um, and it's work, but then that sense of play helps me kind of do the work, yeah. um, especially when talking about like more difficult subjects. Sure. and. I think that's such a brilliant observation because I think a lot of people who exist in those liminal spaces feel the pressure of the, the closing boundaries to say, well, you don't really fit these binary categories. So therefore your perspectives is not easy to manifest. It's not easy to express. We're not really interested. Um, I thought you captured that really well in the poem white people think I'm white. Like that one really spoke to me because I thought, Oh, how many times have, especially people who live in the diaspora as mixed race individuals felt like, well, there's not really a, a racial category. And that's, you know, mm -hmm. even a, an issue at, at stake right now with the United States mm -hmm. census. That there's yeah. no racial category for people from the Middle East. Um, we just mm -hmm. are classified as white, whether or not we are. Um, mm -hmm. And so I thought that you, you tackled those really brilliantly. And I love that you play in that space because I think you're right. There's so much more freedom there to say, well, there aren't these hard and fast boundaries to this experience. I get to dictate it and, and determine it as I wish. Um, mm -hmm. Did you, you said you really loved writing in the heart of the heart of more garbage. Um, was that pretty easy? Were there poems that you really had to sort of struggle with internally to get them from mind to pen to paper? Well, that one, that poem actually, you know, went through so many iterations. It actually mm -hmm didn't look at all like it looks now and oh, it's actually kind of um what's it called um it's like a jigsaw puzzle of different yeah. poems. it's like it's a bit of a Frankenstein poem um and but yeah I think less hard just I think with that one it just kept not feeling finished like every iteration I was like it's not quite it um I think the poems that felt the hardest were the ones where I was directly addressing political situations right. or um, the conversations with Arabs, the ones that are a bit more on the nose or like trying to address difficult topics with humor. Um, mm -hmm. Those were the hardest to write because I wanted both to get a certain message across, leave it fairly open-ended so it didn't feel didactic and it didn't mm -hmm. feel like I'm just saying everything is bad right. um, while also making sure that people know what I'm saying Yeah. Um, and kind of treating certain subjects with both humor and also the, the weight that they deserve. Right. Um, like there's the poem, the one of the conversations with Arabs mm -hmm. that talks about anti-blackness and that one felt yes. hard to write yeah. because it's something that I think about a lot. It's something that I talk to friends about whether they're, friends who are black and friends who are Arab mm -hmm. um and I really wanted and it does use humor um but I wanted to make sure that I was also giving it the um the weight that it deserves um mm -hmm. especially given you know Lebanon's continued history with yeah. um the kafala law and the ways that um other you know women from other countries particularly black women are treated mm -hmm. Um, is like this needs to be talked about but I have to do it right. Um, right and so with that I was just like it just it just needs time you know I talked to different people about it I kind of I rewrote it I thought through all these ideas and sometimes there were things that I was like that's not for me to say you know and then other times I'm like that is for me to say and kind of being honest with myself and truthful about what I was trying to get at 
Sure. I think that's so important. And I'm really grateful that you brought those kinds of issues to the table, because I think, as we talked about early on, there's often this concern like, oh, I can't say too much to criticize because otherwise I'm just giving fodder to people who would who would use it for ill purposes. But it really is coming from a place of like, look at how great we could be. Look at how great this place could be um, if we let go of some of these ugly things, if we fought against them, if we were mm -hmm. anti-racist and we were pro like liberation and all of these these things that we hope for and that I think are evident in leaps and bounds in your in your writing. Um, I'm also curious, as you as you worked on this project, you said that you were doing a lot of conversing. Um, did you talk about the project itself with anyone? And did that lead to any poem where someone says, oh, I have I have a topic you could write about? Or um, you happen to have a conversation you're like, well, that's going to get into the book somehow. Yeah, I, I, I think it's more the second. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't usually want people to tell me what to write a book when <laughs> I get stuck. Not. Yeah. <laughs> both because I'm stubborn, but also because it, it really, I think if I go into a poem, knowing exactly what I want to say, it doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. um, like I can know vaguely what I want to talk about. And with this book, because it was like, had an overarching kind of like theme of things mm -hmm. that I wanted to talk about, I was able to tackle those things without being like, oh my God, I have to talk about this. Right. Um, uh, but definitely, I think particularly less or maybe not less this book, because there's, you know, there's the Masanama, mm -hmm. which is one of the, uh, a poem that's kind of like about my uncle and the ways that he um, was able to come to Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, he told me that story kind of, I think a couple of years ago. And I was like, why have you two told me this story before? <laughs> yeah. It's very good. You've been <laughs> hiding this gem. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I was like, it's perfect for this poem. <laughs> um, but I like talked to him about it to make sure it was okay. Yeah. Um, and like, there was, there was another poem that I wrote that included things about my aunt and then in the end I decided not to put it. Mm -hmm. And so things do make their way in for sure. Like, yeah. I, I forget who it was, but I was listening to either, I think it was an interview where someone was like, don't become friends with writers, especially poets, because they take everything. <laughs> And it might not show up the way you think it will. Like it might, might not be directly about you, but they're going to take that little thing, that weird little thing that you do, and they're going to put it in your pillow. Um, so I definitely do that. And I think my my first book, Not Body, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, it's like it's like a kind of a book of poetry told in letters. So it definitely mm -hmm. has, like it, it thinks about conversation as well. I guess I'm right. generally curious about how people talk to each other. And so that kind of makes its way into my book. Mm. And I think you also sort of allude to the things people don't say to each other as a way mm -hmm. of conversing. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot in the title, the good Arabs, that's, you know, what's not being said is the bad Arabs or just right. the Arabs, because who needs to add a bad to the front? We all kind right. of, based on the Western cultural stereotypes, there's an assumption there. Yeah, uh, definitely. What inspired the title? Actually, I'm curious. You had a lot of great material to to draw from, but... The Good Arabs really stands out as sort of a simple declaration that draws you in and makes you curious. What what led you to decide that that was going to be um, the cover? Mm -hmm. So originally I had written the poem, The Good Arabs, um, which, um, you know, contends with a lot of the ideas that I'm working with in yeah. the book. Um, but I didn't think about it as a, t as a title. Um, I, I like hate titles most of the time and um when I find a good title I'm like yes okay <laughs> this, this is okay this is good um but I was I was like you know what I'm gonna come up with like a wholly new title for this book for this book I'm not gonna look at the poems um and I was I was working at a studio at the time um it was like before the pandemic and I was just like what, what can I call this book so I was working with my friend who's a comic artist mm -hmm. and my other friend who's a ceramicist and I was just like what about this and they were like no what about this <laughs> just like <laughs> screaming at them and I was like in the in the studio the writer's neck was like elevated so mm -hmm. me and my friend who's a comic artist were at the top and then our friend the ceramicist was at the bottom just like screaming <laughs> things um 
And then I was like, wait, I can just look in the book and see what I've already done and steal from myself. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, this is kind of perfect. It works on so many levels. It does. Um, and it's able to encompass so much um, of what's going on in the book. And so I definitely, you know, I was thinking about the idea of mm -hmm. um, the like North American um, idea of the Arab as terrorist. And right. um, I read a stat that said that 50% of representation of Arabs in media is as a terrorist. That um, sounds even like too low a statistic to be yeah. honest. I mean, I'm sure the other one is like a shawarma owner, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> or like a bodega owner or something. Sure. You know? I'm just like the belly dancer that just comes in, has no lines and then leaves. Yeah, leaves. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I was definitely thinking about that and like the power to actually call us good, mm. the power to kind of be like, this is what, this is how I think about it. And even if there's criticism, that's what's going to be shown. Um, and so that felt really important to me. Um, and even within like our own communities, like what goodness is and the way that religion works. Yeah. Um, you know, like I think the idea of goodness is prominent in Christianity and Islam and Judaism. Um, and so I was kind of like thinking about the idea of goodness and how mm -hmm. it's kind of false and what we can actually look for outside of goodness as this kind of moral concept mm -hmm. um, that, you know, on the other side, there's punishment, you know, yeah. um, rather than actually like how we can be in community with each other, how we can kind of be kind to each other, how we can kind of move past morality and actually think about um, care. Um, mm. And so that, that was the, kind of the other side of that. I love that as a concept. And I'm curious to go back to something you said in, in the middle there about kind of putting this work in conversation with these North American stereotypes specifically. Um, did you consider ever writing any of this work in Arabic or did you immediately set out you were going to write it in English so that it sort of directly was conversing um, with an audience who might sort of pause at the notion of the good Arabs? Um, do you, and do you write in Arabic? Do you, do you write poetry in Arabic? Is that just, there's not a huge publication market for it in the North, mm -hmm. in the North American continent, I'm sure. But, um, I'm curious if that's something you do as well. It isn't my, I left Lebanon in when I was 11. Mm -hmm. And so my, I can read and write, mm -hmm. um, and speak, but my, I would say my reading or like my, when I read, it's really slow. Mm -hmm. And when I write, it's kind of more basic writing. Sure. And so I would, I'd be able to write a kid's book. I was telling someone that the other day and I was like, that could be fun. That could be uh, great. <laughs> yeah. But I am actually interested in translation mm -hmm. and translating work from Arabic to English. Um, Cause I do, yeah, I mostly function as a writer in English. Mm -hmm. um, I like to include French and Arabic in sure. my work. Um, given they are languages that are important to me. And so they kind of flitter in and out. But at the end of the day, when I'm writing, I'm writing in English. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely the book, I never really even considered writing it in a different language. Because um, also, you know, as like someone whose book would be published here, mm -hmm. and by here, I mean, you know, like there's distribution in Canada and the US and um, I think the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, right now so you know I know who the audience is going to be and um so I I try not to think too much about the audience when I'm writing but also I do think about the audience particularly mm -hmm. like less as like a marketing thing and more as because this is such a conversation yeah I feel like I'm going in a lot of directions but <laughs> what I mean to say is that yeah it definitely I knew that I was publishing in North America. And so sure. the, that conversation was a North American conversation, but also plenty of people read um, and read and write in English and French in Lebanon. So true. Yeah. Um, colonial I, legacy there has been strong. And I think the trilingual yeah. speaks to that diasporic identity. I personally, I, I don't know many Lebanese inside the diaspora who don't have some familiarity with all three. Yeah, just yeah. part of the the legacy that we carry. 
Yeah, definitely. And like how that actually is so much of all of our experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you mentioned translation and in your bio, we introduced that you're currently working on the translation of a French, is it a, a, a novel? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's auto fiction. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how are you finding that experience translating from French into English? Um, I'm sure there's a lot of artistic challenge there to try and communicate exactly what you're seeing um, without doing the Google Translate version. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that doesn't actually make sense. That's not the emotion they're trying to convey. Um, how's that project been for you? Um, I actually recently sent in the final thing. So now Congratulations. Thank you. It's out of my hands, <laughs> which is fun. Um, I really liked it. I think my brain really works in this kind of puzzle way. Mm -hmm. um, like I really like, you know, I liked the work of like looking at the French and then I think what I would do is do like a um, direct translation and then go in after and be like, that's nope, mm -hmm. nope, nope. And yeah. kind of, it's it's interesting to see like on the, on the level, cause I mean, grammatically I know how French is English how French is different than English. Right. Um, but then on even like a, a sensory level and like a sound level, kind of trying to figure that out is the more difficult part. Mm -hmm. um, also, sometimes you're like, they've said two words in French and six in English or vice versa. <laughs> and trying to be like, how do you kind of translate that? Sure. Um, yeah, translation is really fun. And I think it's... Uh, it's a cool experiment to do for yourself. And then um, it definitely made me want to translate more mm. um, and kind of thinking through like upping my Arabic education so that I can try to translate from Arabic to English. Because a lot of translators, there are Arabs who do that, but mostly it's white people, which is kind mm. of disappointing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that happens too with like Latin American writers sure. and um, East Asian writers, like kind of like places where North American, there's like a big audience for certain kinds of translations. Right. And you look at the name of the person who's translated and it's often a white mm -hmm. person who like went to school to like learn this language. And I think it's interesting to have someone who has the, the cultural texture within them who's yeah. able to translate. It certainly adds a different layer that you can't necessarily imitate. And, you know, there are plenty of excellent translators out there, but yeah, um, it is, I think it's, it's wonderful to allow someone, especially someone who exists in these liminal spaces, who, mm -hmm. who knows both sides of the coin to, to make the translation to help that literature on its journey from one mm -hmm. space to another. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the anthology, are you also contributing, just editing? Um, right now, I'm like considering contributing because oh, um, I, I mean, there, there's one other queer Arab mm. um, anthology and it's like a, I mean, it's already out. It's also nonfiction. Mm. So this one's kind of going to be the first of its kind. Right. Um, and so originally I was like, do I want to contribute? But then I think I, it feels nice to have my work live alongside a lot of like really amazing, beautiful writers um, but right now I'm in me and Sammy are in the process of like the editing, mm -hmm. um, which has been so fun and really great. And I love, I also love editing um, and like working with people to kind of achieve their goals yeah. and kind of achieve the thing, you know, help them push the work to be like what they're trying to get at. Um, and it's been such a nice like community experience and like meeting writers who I didn't know before. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm really excited to share it with the world and for people to get to see the beauty of it. I um, think it's going to be wonderful. I think, you know, there, the world is all the more beautiful for the diversity of voices that are offered. Mm -hmm. And especially as we see this sort of increasing trend in, in queer anthologies, queer writing, queer focused writing, writing by queer authors, it's, it's really lovely to finally see that breaking through to more mainstream audiences so that they can understand and and value and just find the beauty and all of these things that you guys already know are beautiful and you're just like uh -huh. time you guys figured it out. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that's a, a truly remarkable um, project to be working on are you working on anything else just for yourself personally are you kind of 
you've got these two incredible books, you're taking a pause until you get the anthology and the translations done. Yeah, I think I want to start writing again soon. I've like missed it. I think mm -hmm. um, working on other people's work is delightful. And also I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, I want to, I want to go back to, to that space. Mm -hmm. um, feels like a part of me that's like been quiet for too long. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I kind of want to start at least writing just for myself. I don't have a project in mind, um, but I'm sure that will eventually you know, come out. Sure. Um, but yeah, I do want to go back to writing and to kind of seeing what comes out now because the last kind of new work that I made was a few years ago now. Um, and so I'm curious about how even like, I mean, it's been a wild past few years for many of us. So yes. that's definitely surely affected the way I think. <laughs> so yes. it'll yeah. be an interesting um, comparison to look back at the good Arabs and say, all right, how how has my vision changed or perhaps stayed the same? And mm -hmm. what yeah. added nuance can I bring to the conversation? Mm -hmm. um, if people who have watched this interview and seen the publicity for it would like to purchase a copy of The Good Arabs, uh, where can they do that? Where's the best place for them to do that? Um, so you can quite easily order it to your local bookstore. Um, I always recommend that people do that. And yes. support. we love to support independent and local bookstores. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And then if you want to buy it online, you can buy it directly from metonymy. Okay. Um, and there's also, I mean, metonymy itself is a queer publisher. And so mm -hmm. it has, um, and I recently started working with metonymy. So to, uh, doing some promo, but yeah. there's just a lot of really um, special books um, that metonymy has previously published. So it's worth checking out. That's fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, would you do you have any last comments or thoughts you wanted to share before we close out the interview? No, I think that's good. I talked a lot. <laughs> you were wonderful, Eli. Thank you so much. Congratulations again. Um, this has been our interview with Eli Tare and Bishalini Lynch, the honorable mention winner for the Khairala Prize for 2022. Um, they won for their anthology of poetry, The Good Arabs, which you can acquire from Metonymy Press directly. Um, support your local bookstore, support Eli's amazing work, and um, thank you again for joining us, and congratulations once more. Mabruk. It was truly wonderful reading. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course.